Thanks for coming to this talk. My name is Jose Alcerreca. I'm a developer relations engineer at Google, working on Android. My name is Yid Boyar. I'm an engineer in the Android Toolkit team. And today we're going to talk about live data. Live data is one of the uh, first architecture components that we released uh, last year. And in this talk, we're going to explain what it is. We're going to talk about some of the transformations that you can do, how to combine live data. And then we're going to talk about some patterns and anti-patterns that you might want to avoid. So live data is a simple lifecycle aware observable data holder. We're going to explain all these characteristics. Uh, but first, we're going to start with observable. What's an observable? So in our object-oriented world, probably the easiest way of uh, communicating one component and another is by having a reference from one object to another and just call it directly. However, in Android, this might have some problems. As we all know, components in Android have different life cycles and different lifespans. You might be familiar with this diagram. It's the view model scope diagram. A simple thing like a device rotation can actually recreate the activity. So uh, you probably know that having a uh, reference to the activity in this view model would be a bad idea because it leads to memory leaks, uh, even crashes with no pointer exceptions. So instead of having a reference to the activity in the view model, we're going to try to have a reference to the view model in the activity. So how do we communicate? How do we send data from the view model to the activity? Well, instead of doing that, we're going to let the activity observe the view, the view model. And for that, we're going to use observables, live data. Let's see how this uh, looks with a little bit of code. In the view model, we expose our live data. We're go you're, going to, you're going to uh, see a lot of examples of how to expose live data from a view model. And then in our activity, we make the actual subscription. And we do that by calling the observe method on the observable. The first parameter is something called a lifecycle owner. Ed is going to talk about this in a, in a second. And the second parameter is an observer. This is what's called whenever the observable, the live data, uh, the live data's value is changed. Uh, so Jose mentioned that you want to reference an object in the uh, larger scope, like a view model, from an object in a smaller scope, like an activity. But of course, when you observe something, it has to keep a reference back to you to be able to call it. So there is a reference. Uh, but why is this not a problem with live data? Well, live data is a lifecycle aware component. What do we mean by this? To be able to observe a live data, you have to provide a life cycle. And when you provide this life cycle, it basically maintains your subscription for you for free. So if your observer's life cycle is not in a good state, like a stopped activity, it's not going to call you back. Or when your activity or fragment is destroyed, it's going to remove this subscription automatically for you. So you don't have the burden of maintaining this subscription. So if you go back to the previous graph, your live data observer will only be called if it is between started and before it is stopped. Uh, this makes sure you don't need to care about things like fragment transactions. Once you receive an observable value, you know you're in a good state. Uh, probably the most like, distinctive property of live data is that it's a data holder. So it's not a stream. We keep saying this. But what do I mean by that Like, it's not a stream, but it's a value holder? Uh, if you go back to our previous graphs, on the right, we have a live data in our view model. And on the left, we have our activity or fragment that's observing this live data. Once you set a value on the live data, just values pass to the activity. Similarly, if the value changes, the activity receives the new updated value. Now, the difference happens. When you change the value when the observer is not in an active state, it has, it has no idea that value C is never dispatched to the activity. And let's say while your activity is still in a background thread, oh, sorry, in a background, on a thread, uh, you set a new value, and your activity still doesn't see this. Now, the data holder property comes in now when your activity comes back, that user is seeing is in the foreground it receives the latest value from the V model. Uh, 
as you can see, the value C has never a right to the activity because LiDate only cares about holding a single value and it's the latest value. This works perfect for UI because you only want to show what it is right now. Uh, but if you are trying to process a stream of events, this is not what you're looking for. Similarly, if you change the value after activity is destroyed, nothing happens. OK, let's talk about how to combine live data and talk about transformations. The library provides two, map and switch map, but you can create your own using mediator live data. We already said that live data is great to communicate a view and a view model. But what if we have a third component, maybe a repository, that is also exposing live data? How do we make this subscription from the view model? We don't have a life cycle there. What if the app is even more complicated and the repository is also observing uh, data sources in this case? Well, Ed once said to me that if you need a life cycle in your view model, what do you really want well, no, You probably need a transformation, but it's actually wrong. <laughs> Sorry, <Come on>. it. <laughs> so, you know, what I say is that you definitely need a transformation. Don't ever use a life cycle in your view model. So different. Bravo. <laughs> so, okay, how do we make um, the first sample is a bridge between the view and the repository? How do we get to that uh, live data? we use a transformations map, which is what I call a one-to-one -one static transformation. In the view model, we expose a, view, um, a live data. In this case, it's called view model result. And uh, it's the result of a transformations map. The first parameter is the source, the live data source, which is the live data exposed by the repository. And the second parameter is the transformation function. In this case, it's simply converting from the data layer model to the UI model. And this is how the signature would look like in Kotlin. It has a um, source, which is a live data of x, and it returns a live data of y. So it's a bridge of live data. And then in the, uh, in the middle, we have a transformation function that transforms from x to y. It doesn't know anything about uh, live data. Uh, so when you establish that transformation, the key here is that the life cycle is automatically carried over for you. So let's say you run a transformation of a couple of live data, and at the end, it is a live data that you hold on to. When someone subscribes to it, that life cycle is automatically propagated to the inner live data elements without you doing anything. And it's completely managed by us, so it's completely safe. Uh, another transformation we provide is switch maps. When do we need this? Uh, imagine you have an application where you have a user manager that keeps the logged in user ID somewhere, like in a disk. Uh, and whenever that logged in user ID, when you grab it, you need to talk to your user repository to get the actual user object. And that probably goes to the database and also the server to return you this user object. But that repository returns you a live data as well because user object might change, right? It may return you the cache one while it updates from the server. So you're in a situation where you have a live data of a logged in user ID and a live data of a user, and you need to chain these things. So map works if you are chaining from an ID to a user, but how do we chain from an ID to a live data of a user? That's switch map. Uh, so if you look at the, uh, that example, basically we call switch map. We provided this user ID live data, that's a live data, and then our function this time returns a live data. So the signature looks like this. You have a source, and at the end, you have a live data, and you provide a function that converts, converts the value x to a live data. What this technically does is, every time that user ID changes, it calls your function. You give it a new live data. It unsubscribes from the previous live data you returned, and that subscribes to the new one. It's like switching tracks, or I think this comes from like switchboards. Uh, but it's completely managed for you. And it's still life cycle where you get all the benefits of using live data. Now, we only provide map and switch map. We don't have like a million transformations like some, some other libraries. Uh, the, but this is very limiting. And sometimes you may want to write your own. And we actually don't want to provide many. But if you want to write your own, it's very easy. If I show you our, like, literally the code we have for the map implementation that Jose talked about, 
it does the CVS source and it does returns the live data and you give it a function, right? All it does is it creates this mediator live data class and adds the given source as a source for this mediator live data. What in which it kind of tells us that the value of this mediator live data is derived from this other live data. So whenever that other live data changes, call my callback, and in the callback, we basically apply the function to the value and set as a value on the mediator live data. This is like super simple to write. And look, there is no life cycle here, but all of this code is life cycle aware. Uh, so if it's so easy, let's create a new one. Uh, let's say you want to create something where user is filling a form. You have a bunch of strings, and you want to have the total count showing somewhere. So you have a live data and a letter live data. And you basically have a live data of integer that has the total number of characters in those live data elements. And this integer updates if any of those values update. So we call our function total lang. We receive a list of live data, and we return a live data. What we do here is we have a sum function. It's actually very simple. It goes through all of the live data and sums their length. Uh, we need to account for nulls here because live data allows nulls, so you need to be aware of it. But this is very simple. It's basically look at all the live data values and sum the total length. Once we did that, we add each given live data as a source to our mediator. It basically says the value of this mediator depends on these other live data. So anytime any of them changes, the framework calls back our do some function, which calculates the new value for their mediator live data. And this is it. It's like four lines of code, and you have an operation, a transformation on your live data. Now, uh, there are some common mistakes you can make while using live data, and we want to touch base on these things. One, one thing we see a lot is, let's say you have you make a web request, it returns you a giant JSON, and then you convert it to your objects. Using a live data transformation for doing that is not a good idea, because live data is a value holder. So the long string you fetch from your server is going to stay in memory. It's going to hold on to that. So you probably don't want to use live data for something like that. Instead, just do it as a one-shot operation. OK, the second item is about sharing instances of live data. Uh, at one point, I was uh, trying to make an app with live data. And I had a repository that was a singleton. And there was only one observer in the activity. So I said, OK, I can just save some live data and share a single live data. I had something like this a repository, it takes a data source. And then uh, the mutable live data that we are returning in load item is shared by everyone that calls load item. Now, this is fine. It works. But there's a very interesting edge case. And this, this anti-pattern is about you thinking which observers are going to be uh, uh, active. And the edge case is activity transitions. There is um, this case in Android where two activities are going to be active at the same time. So imagine activity one observes item number one, and activity two observes item number two. When we load activity two, is going to uh, load data for item two, but because they are sharing the same live data, activity one is also going to receive that data. And because it's in the middle of an animation, you're going to see a flash, you're going to see a glitch, and obviously, that's a very bad user experience. Yeah, basically, like if you're class like a repository and you created a field that's an instance of live data, you're probably doing it wrong. Yeah, the solution, obviously, is to create a live data every time. It's very lightweight. You're not going to save much by avoiding this. The third item is about where and when to create your transformations. And this is all about wiring. It's similar to when you create a, a circuit. You lay down your components, and you wire everything up. And for a known set of inputs, you're going to have a known set of outputs. But you don't unplug a wire while it's in operation and plug it somewhere else, right? This is exactly what this view model is doing. Lots of horrible things happening in, in this view model, by the way. <laughs> for, for starters. You should, you should have like a don't do this in these slides. It Otherwise, says don't do this, will... literally. That does... OK. Because <laughs> <laughs> actually, someone will copy-paste it and then blame us for recommending it. 
that's the standard way of doing it. So first, it's exposing item data, which is a variable. It's not a val, it's a var. And also, it's exposing a mutable live data. Almost, you should almost never do this. Uh, Two-way data binding is the exception to this, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, you should always expose something that is immutable so that our, uh, your observers can't change it. So after subscription, we call load data from our activity to set the ID of the thing that we want to load. And then we are reassigning item data to something new. But the subscription already happened. So the observer is not going to know that you made this reassignment. Yeah. The then, solution. Like, actually, even if you're returning the live data there, uh, and your observer is resubscribing to the new live data, now it is subscribed to the previous one and the new one because you never removed the subscription. So the solution to this requires a little, fiv a little bit of plumbing. We have two live data. One is mutable, and it's private to this view model. And the other one is the one that is exposed uh, to the view from the view model. And it is a transformation switch map. The source of this switch map is that mutable live data. So that every time item ID changes, then the transformation function is going to be called, and data source, which returns the live data, is going to be called with the appropriate ID. After the subscription to this item data has happened, uh, we call load data, we pass the string. This ID might come from an intent in the activity or whatever. And then when we set the value, then it triggers an update, and everything is going to work as you expect it to work. OK, so if you would like to think that live data is awesome and it solves all the problems, it doesn't. Uh, it's designed for a very specific use case. and. Uh, we see people trying to use it in other areas, and they, they struggle with it. So I want to make it clear. If you're writing an application that has lots of like, operators and streams, you totally bought into this reactive uh, idea, just use RxJava. Like, don't try to add like, a million transformations on top of live data to make it work. It's not designed for that. Uh, just go learn Rx. Uh, if you have things that are not related to a lifecycle or a UI, let's say you are trying to synchronize the user's location to your backend service, uh, there is no UI there, there is no lifecycle there. Like there is no reason to use live data for something like that. Either use a callback, or if you are using RxJava, that will still work. Another use case is having these like one-shot operations, uh, like mentioned. With, now you fetch some data and then you convert it. You write into your database, load back, and return it. Uh, for those things, if you are using Kotlin, coroutines are actually like a really new, new exciting area. Uh, again, you might use Guava Concurrent, or you can use RxJava, but don't use live data because we didn't design it for that. Live data works very well as the last layer for your UI. It's perfectly OK. It is like kind of the best solution. But if you try to scale it, it's just not going to work. Uh, so many things we mentioned in this talk, actually Jose has blog posts on the Android developers medium publishing. Uh, you can go read them. Uh, check out our samples on GitHub. We have simple usages of live data as well as like, a complete application, the GitHub browser sample with like using room, has like multiple data sources, transformations. And also you can look at the source code for iOS scheduler app, which is the same app in Dev Summit. And if it has bugs, you can blame this guy. He wrote it. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I hope this was useful, and we will be in the around. area like around after the talks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.